Hello, today we will be talking about the red eye. It's one of the more common problems as far as the eye is concerned and it scares a lot of the patients going into the clinic such that you need to understand what's causing the red eye. There are a lot of them and it's usually because of the dilation of the conjunctival or scleral vessels that turns the eye reddish. Usually, it's because of inflammatory or infectious processes and you need to be able to differentiate what the possible problem is aside from having a red eye. So, whenever a patient runs to your clinic, tells you, doctor, I have a red eye, I got scared, or my parents or my friends told me I have a red eye, you need to be able to sh shift through the different problems in order to find out what your patient's problem is and how to deal with it. Let's go with the differentials. One of them is entropion or trichiasis. So here you can see uh, the lashes in your patient's uh, eyelids. These parts are actually touching the sclera. They're touching the eyeball itself and it's scratching against that. That's why the eye is red because there's friction on the area. It's irritating the conjunctiva and your eyes, uh, your patient's eyes turn red. Now, this is an, another example. The lashes, which are supposed to be turning outwards like the ones on the upper left, are now actually pointing downwards like the one on the lower right. Now, you could probably epilate this, meaning remove those lashes. You could also try to avert the lids if it could still be averted. Otherwise, if the lids are permanently oriented like that, you may need to go into surgery. <clears throat> now, this is an entropion. If you notice, on the lower eyelid of your patient, this part, you can't see any of the lashes because the eyelid itself is turned inwards. The eyelid itself uh, is inverted inwards and the lashes, even though they are oriented properly, are now being uh, oriented towards the eyeball and it's scratching the eye. It's very painful. The patient will be um, tearing a lot. You could avert the eyelids, uh, but some, most of the time, especially if it's because of an infection, you may, um, you may eventually go into surgery. Now, this is called an entropion. Now, again, another example. <clears throat> the lashes itself, most of them are turned out, but the ones you can see in the middle, they're turned inwards and they're scratching the eyes. Again, another example of an entropion. Look at the lower lids. It's oriented inwards. You can't see the lashes. And if you can't see um, these um, lashes, which are supposed to be averted out, these lashes will be scratching the eyeball, causing the redness, the irritation, the pain, and the tearing of your patient. Now, ectropion means the eyelids are turned outwards. The previous examples we showed you, the entropion, the eyelids are oriented inwards. Now, ectropion is the eyelids are, are oriented outwards. Uh, the eyelashes are not scratching the eyeball. However, the eyeball itself is now very dry. It's being exposed. Even if your patient tries to close the eyes, it will not close properly. The eyes will dry up and the dryness will cause... Um, the the blurring in the patient's vision and it could eventually dry up so much that it's going to permanently damage the eye and your patient's vision. Now blepharitis basically is um, defined as infection of your eyelashes. These are examples of how your patient's eyelashes will look if they have an infection. They will look like they have dandruff. You can see the lashes even though the patient is uh, a manual laborer or one exposed to dusty environments, they're not supposed to have uh, white flakes or dan uh, dandruff-like materials. 
these are an example of an infection of the eyelashes and this debris will fall inside the eye and cause a lot of irritation and will trigger the redness of your patient's eye. You need to be able to clean this properly so that the patient will recover and the infection can be controlled. This is another example. You can see the yellow uh, uh, yellow discharge actually caking on the patient's lashes. These are actually a very, very significant infection. And you need to be able to clean this. Otherwise, the infection just basically regenerates. You need to clean this and instruct the patient to clean this. Sometimes with baby shampoo and sometimes with other uh, gel cleaning materials. But cleaning this is imperative. Usually, we will tell the patients to, do, uh, to clean the lashes at least twice a day. Okay, uh, this is a, <coughs> a uh, bigger, um, um, this is a zoomed in version of the eyelashes showing to you the discharge. So the eyelashes, even in patients who are dealing with a lot of dust in the environment, should always be very clean. If you see a lot of this, this is a good sign that the patient has an infection. And sometimes the infection could have stayed there for a lot of time, becomes very chronic. Um, it's, go, it's causing damage also, uh, already to the cornea. Aside from just simple infection of the lashes, they're now creating more permanent damage on the patient's cornea. Now, don't just look at the eyelashes. Look underneath the eyelids. The, eye, the eyelids would might have some foreign body as in this case the eyelid was flipped and you can and there was a small metallic material that's trapped in the lashes what happens now is that every time the eye moves this uh, material will be scratching against the patient's cornea causing a lot of damage your patient will be telling you uh, that they have they have something in their eye they feel something in their eye but they can't see anything um, that's wrong with it you need to also flip the lashes aside from just inspecting the eye because trapped material like this will cause a lot of damage in your patient's eye. They will cause what we call corneal abrasion. Now, corneal abrasion, this is a more severe type of corneal abrasion. A corneal abrasion is basically like scratches on a clear, uh, clear glass. Your cornea is clear and if you scratch the cornea, it's usually very hard to see the damage unless it's very, very extensive. The trick for this is to use a fluorescein dye. A fluorescein dye applied on the cornea will stick to areas of the cornea without an epithelium, such that uh, problems like this would now, uh, would now be easily diagnosed. For example, this is a case on the, uh, on, um, this is a case of a corneal abrasion. Uh, the epithelium was scratched off, but because the cornea was transparent, it's very hard to see. The drawing beside it is actually showing you the extent of the damage, which is not that visible. It's now harder to follow up the patient and see if the cornea is actually healing. So you need to understand that uh, putting a fluorescein dye would tell you how big the problem is, how extensive the problem is, and also allow you to follow up the problem such that you know when the patient is healing or progressing. Now, a corneal foreign body is very common, especially in workers who, who deal with a lot of um, industrial activity. For example, peop, uh, patients who are gr using grinders or uh, drilling um, industrial activities and uh, in this case, this is a metallic foreign body that actually embedded in the cornea. Most of your patients will try to remove it on their own by washing their eyes or using something eccentric like getting a piece of uh, hair and running it across the eye or getting a piece of cloth or a piece of tissue and then try to scrape things off, especially if they can see it. But this usually causes more damage. You can easily remove this if you have a magnified view like this using clinic instruments and using very fine instruments to remove this. 
if you cause um, if you um, try to remove this um, with DIYs or do it yourself uh, activities you might end up causing more problems now this is a unique case because this is a metallic foreign body that was removed the center part this part if you notice is actually very clear uh, that part uh, is where the original metallic foreign body was and what you're seeing right now is like a ring of metal it's based it's called a rust ring the original foreign body came off or was removed easily however the rust that was left was is eating its way through the epithelium of the cornea it's now embedded in the cornea and it's more difficult to remove this so you will not be able to remove something like this a rust ring by simply washing your eyes or even uh, using a lot of eccentric activities like um, using hair or a piece of cloth or a piece of cotton you need to remove this with um, surgical material uh, surgical instruments now this is a metallic foreign body that embedded inside the eye but not just on the cornea but it went through now the if you notice the cornea itself is no longer clear it's now hazy because the inflammation actually uh, of the uh, foreign body actually caused a an infection already so it's not lo it's no longer just an inflammation because of the foreign body there is no now an active infection and the patients uh, in intraocular pressure have risen that's why the eye the conjunctiva is now very red the cornea is now hazy and the pressure of this patient's eye has already gone up all because the inflammation and the infection caused a cascade of other problems aside from simple irritation usually you can use the tip of a needle to remove a foreign body like this so you, uh, again you need steady hands you we usually anesthetize the patient's eye with an eye drop usually it's proparacaine <clears throat> once the patient's eye is anesthetized it's easier to remove the uh, the foreign body because some patients because of the pain of removing the foreign body will react and your needle might cause a lot of damage so anesthetize the patient make sure the patient is calm before trying to remove it but using an instrument like this like uh, the, the the tip of a needle <clears throat> will make a very very clean removal but make sure your patient is controlled and the patient is or uh, is calm before attempting to do this procedure now <clears throat> not just an abrasion how about if it's an ulcer now an ulcer is basically an infection or a keratitis an infection of the cornea uh, not all ulcers are circular this one is a linear um, uh, inflammation this you, you can see the opacity on the cornea the, the inflammation and the infection will cause a reaction in the conjunctiva turning it red so the patient's eye usually will be painful and very red now <clears throat> the arrow is pointing to a round um, ulcer i want you to pay particular attention with the way the, sh uh, the ulcer is sh shaped it's not just one big blob of white there's a denser circular area in the middle and then a, a more uh, a less dense uh, outer uh, area now in order to to judge whether your uh, ulcer is actually infectious or not aggressive or not you need to look at the borders not just at the center looking at the borders you need to be able to see um, the the feathering or uh, a very very clear border the more aggressive your ulcer is the more it will try to infiltrate the surrounding areas such that the edges would not be very very clear it's rapidly trying to invade the surrounding areas if it's uh, if it's not very um, aggressive then the areas around uh, around your ulcer will be very well delineated meaning your 
uh, infection or your ulcer will be very behaved such that it will uh, you don't need to be extremely aggressive in treating that patient's eye an ulcer especially an aggressive ulcer could lead to a loss of vision of your patient's eye within 24 hours especially if it's one of the pseudomonas strain which are very very aggressive again of an aggressive uh, um, infection um, you, the conjunctiva is now very very con uh, congested the eyeball itself is inflamed the cornea is now reacting it's no longer very clear and that uh, the patient's vision is now compromised now this you will notice that there seems to be a cascade of white flowing from the ulcer that those are basically pus that's flowing into the anterior chamber it's causing a white uh, looks like a fluid layer and basically it's called the hypopion or pus inside the anterior chamber and you see that it's coming from the center of the ulcer so the the reaction um, is uh, very very aggressive your ulcer may at this time have penetrated the entire cornea making it more dangerous risking your patient's vision in this case you need to be more aggressive especially with your antibiotic regimen and uh, you need to follow this patient very very closely not all ulcers are circular this one is dendritic this one is a, a herpes uh, uh, a herpes ulcer it looks like the edges of um, uh, the roots of a plant now this is usually not visible with the naked eye you will need to stain this with fluorescein that's why you have why well, that's why it's colored blue and um, and the uh, injury is actually glowing green because of the fluorescein dye this cornea will usually be numb it will not be uh, it doesn't feel pain it looks bad but it doesn't feel pain because the virus actually is attacking the nerves now sometimes a patient's use of contact lenses would trigger redness this is one of the um, rare forms the contact lens has broken off you can see the edges here at the side and the uh, the shape means uh, the the, uh, the um, patient tried to remove the uh, contact lens but it uh, it was torn and the patient could not find it anymore giving the patient a uh, fluorescein dye would actually allow it to glow allow it to be easily removed because again contact lenses are transparent it's very hard to identify them when you're trying to uh, remove them and your vision um, is not already uh, is not that clear now conjunctivitis is basically an inflammation of the conjunctiva the more common ones that you see is viral conjunctivitis that's what you hear the most uh, it's usually referred to as pink eyes or sore eyes it's very uh, it's uh, very very contagious and that's what usually is in people's mind when they see that their eyes are very red so viral conjunctivitis are self-limiting that means even if you don't treat them they will actually resolve on its own uh, treating them might um, shorten their duration and um, it's usually caused by adenovirus which is found elsewhere in your nasopharyngeal duct uh, nasopharyngeal uh, tracts um, what's contagious about viral conjunctivitis is basically the tears and the discharge try asking your patient if they have a discharge especially in the morning that's when the discharge usually is, uh, gets accumulated sometimes if you just check it in the middle of the day you won't see any discharge but if you ask the patient if they wake up with a very sticky eye and they have a lot of discharge and usually they will say yes it's worse in the morning when i wake up and usually in the, the rest of the day there's very very little of the discharge also try to check 
the sides of the in front of the ear you probably will be able to <clears throat> feel some lymph adenopathies some of the lymph nodes might be swollen you can feel them in front that's where the the discharge you should add that's where the um <clears throat> the lymph uh, drainage of the eye usually goes it's in front of the ears preauricular and under the jawline or the submandibular patients with um, corneal involvement will have a longer period of healing usually six months a bacterial conjunctivitis on the other hand is like your viral conjunctivitis uh, leveled up 10 times the discharge will be stickier more mucopurulent sometimes purulent they will be more colorful not just white they will probably be yellow sometimes even green the eyes would be more swollen and they will last longer they will last definitely more than two weeks if left unattended and most of the time they will not resolve if you ignore them unlike the viral conjunctivitis bacterial conjunctivitis needs to be treated because usually they will cause more damage and stay longer and could even become chronic the longer uh, the inflammation happens the more damage it will it will do in this case uh, the patient's co um, conjunctivitis has stayed for a long time it's been eating out some a lot of the patient's lashes and causing damage they will be uh, the discharge will be more prominent the conjunctiva will be more swollen in this case you can see that the conjunctiva in the lower eyelid is now more prominent the uh, the pus is uh, the, or the discharge is actually in between uh, the mounds of flesh that's why you can see that um, how thick the conjunctiva has be, uh, the bulbar conjunct uh, sorry the palpebral conjunctiva has become now bleeding usually scares your patients the most it's not the dangerous the most dangerous ones but it's the scarier ones because patients usually get scared because of the things that they see on tv their eyes now become very red it looks like it was uh, a crayon was drawn on the the eyeball itself or, or a red pencil pen was used to color the eyes they're very very red and usually especially with this age group it's because of trauma or hypertension some of the blood vessels broke filling the conjunct uh, the subconjunctival area with blood the more the brighter the redness of the um of the uh, of the hemorrhage the more recent it is the darker the color the the longer it has been there so when your patient is following up after several days you want to see color changes you want to see you don't want to see very very bright red that means there's fresh rebleeds or the bleeding has not stopped yet the bleeds will usually well, the, hem the hemorrhages will usually follow the law of gravity they will they can start from very high up but eventually they will be pulled down the patients might get scared because they think it's a different bleed because the last ones that they saw were up were higher and the ones they're seeing now are in the lower part it's just because the blood the hemorrhage has been migrating and following the law of gravity allergies could also cause conjunctivitis they're more benign it's basically just a, re a reaction to the environment sometimes it's um because of uh, what's in the environment could be the dust the smoke the pollution could be uh, animals that are furry the plants that are uh, very flowery or <clears throat> sometimes chemical fumes or sometimes things that your patient touch and uh, when they scratch the eye found its way into the eye <clears throat> they will almost always be described as itchy they will be tearing they will be haziness of the uh, or blurring of vision and sometimes you will see skin reactions like the one on the left uh, the skin react uh, the skin reactions um, <clears throat> could be a a telltale sign that the patient has uh, an allergy 
and it has found its way not just on the skin but also into the eye the discharge will be more liquid than usual it will be very um, the eyes will be uh, itchy and the uh, the problem usually goes away when the when the antigen whatever's triggering the patient uh, the patient's reaction goes away too sometimes it will just affect one eye most of the time it will affect both eyes and comparing one eye with the other will tell you that there is actually a problem in the other eye not just the eyeball more often than not even the eyelids are affected checking the eyelids will show that you have uh, papillary reactions and what you're seeing here are actually chronic uh, signs of chronic uh, conjunctivitis there are already concretions and papillary reactions the eyelid itself the inner part of the eyelid itself is supposed to be white with very uh, with some blood vessels not as red as this one and patients will keep telling you that they also have blurring of the eyes and very prominent itching chronic conjunctivitis could cause very very large follicles like this one this is now called a giant um, uh, a giant cell uh, the follicles are now very very large uh, if you see the entire uh, eyelids um, already reacting you could call it a cobblestone reaction because of how cobblestones uh, in England are, are usually viewed but this is a sign of a a, a very prom a very chronic and significant allergy in the patient now shingles also can cause red eyes shingles is more often uh, more often than not a skin problem or a skin infection by the herpes um, the uh, herpes virus herpes zoster virus the telltale sign is it looks like there's a line um, <coughs> there's a line that the the lesions will not cross it's ve uh, if you're a fan of batman this will be two face one part will be infected and scarred very very painful and the other side it's normal it's due to the uh, to the, how your nerves are laid out your nerves will never cross your uh, midline if the lesions cross the midline then it's not shingles it's not herpes zoster now if it hits the tip of your nose it's called Hutchins, uh, Hutchinson sign and it's a telltale sign that your eyeball will also be affected okay, usually it's just the skin the eyelids which will cause irritation will cause pain your patients will react and will have very red eyes but if you see a lesion at the tip of the nose or sometimes at the side of the tip of the nose then you can already assume even without looking at the eye patient's eye that the eyeball itself has been uh, affected they are self-limiting you can use some antiviral uh, ointments or antiviral drops but they will resolve whether or not you treat the patient so the treatment is mostly supportive if the patient feels pain you give some pain reliever if your patient's eyes are tearing drying up then you can give them some lubricants to alleviate the pain now cellulitis both preceptal and orbital could cause red eyes now preceptal means the uh, the cellulitis or the soft tissue in infection is just in front of the orbital septum and orbital if it has gone past the orbital septum and infected the part of the eye that is in already inside the orbit now if it's just limited outside usually there will be pain um, there will be swelling but the patient's eyeball and vision will not be affected the patient's movements will show no pain however the swelling on the outside of the uh, the skin the uh, the skin of the eyelids will cause the patient significant pain or tearing but the eyeball itself can move freely no pain and the patient's vision should not be affected significantly except probably for the dryness and the swelling from the outside of the eye but the vision itself is expected to be intact this one is a measles um, cellulitis infection 
on the area around the eyes would cause significant inflammation. Again, this is a supportive treatment. Aside from treating the infection itself, you just try to cater to what your patient's needs are. If the eyes are very dry, if it's uh, tearing, then you can give lubricants and anti-inflammatories. However, when it goes past the orbital septum, and you know that because the conjunctiva will now be involved, the sclera will be involved, moving the eye would cause pain, your patient's vision would be very, very much affected. So imagine the eyeball, imagine what's around the eyeball. <clears throat> Any movement in that area will now trigger pain. So you know there are EOMs or extraocular muscles around the eyeball. So if there's a swelling inside the orbit, moving those muscles will be painful. You know the optic nerve is there, so um, your vision will be affected. So basically, you need to be very aggressive with this because a small, uh, uh, a small distance from the back of your uh, eyeball, from the back of your orbit, is already your patient's brain. Now, episcleritis and scleritis are very commonly uh, seen in our patients. This is base, uh, This is a scleritis. Uh, if you notice, this, uh, the inflammation is limited to a certain area, not the entire eyeball is affected. This one is episcleritis. Look at the blood vessels. They're oriented in different directions. And here you can see a nodule. This is a nodular episcleritis. Again, you can see the blood vessels. Some are oriented uh, horizontally, some are oriented diagonally or vertically. And you see a a very prominent nodule. Now, a nodular episcleritis is more difficult to treat because the nodule itself is uh, protecting the um, it's protecting the antigen. What's whatever is triggering the problem? Usually, uh, an infection. So it's uh, the nodule is your uh, body's way of trying to fight off the disease by um, attacking it with. Um, everything that it can throw at the antigen. Unfortunately, this uh, type of defense also protects it from your medications uh, such that it responds <clears throat> uh, later and it responds slower to your medications than an, a diffuse episcleritis does. Now, this is a scleritis. If you notice the color is now different, it's now more purplish. It's because the sclera itself is thinning out. It's exposing more of the colored um, areas underneath. The swelling is deeper. The, the pain is actually more dull because of the involvement of the deeper structures. It, uh, both scleritis and episcleritis responds very well to steroid treatment. So what if the inflammation is not it's not just on the skin, it's already in front of the eye, and uh, called an anterior uveitis or simply uveitis. <clears throat> One, the cornea is not very clear because the area underneath it uh, is inflamed, the, the aqueous is inflamed, uh, usually because of an involvement of the iris. The blood vessels are not just inflamed, they're also tortuous. So your patients will be exhibiting signs of inflammation with the difference from a regular um, conjunctivitis being that there is no discharge. The inner part of the cornea would sometimes show a keratic precipitate or a KP. In this case, those white blotches that you see are keratic precipitates. They're actually plastered at the back of the uh, at the back of the cornea. There are actually clumps of macrophages or white blood cells that you're uh, body is uh, utilizing to fight off the inflammation or an, or an infection. So it looks like basically a, a, a ball of wet uh, tissue paper that you threw against um, a glass door. So it sticks there and the more, uh, the, the more wet it looks, the larger it is, the more active your inflammation is. Now let's go also go to glaucoma. We'll not go to, uh, too deep into glaucoma because we'll be discussing it uh, in detail later on. So your patient's eye will be very red. This is one of the more 
uh, common things that your uh, that will pop into your mind whenever you see a red eye is this glaucoma. So a glaucoma in a red eye usually is because the pressure is already very high. That means the cornea might be compromised, it might be edematous, the conjunctiva will be red, the eyeball itself will be hard. You can differentiate it from um, even with, uh, you can check an eyeball if it's very hard, even if you don't have the instruments. Try to fill the eyeball with your finger, just on top of the eyeball, through the eyelids, and then bounce your finger on top of that, and then compare it with your nose. That is called doughy. That's how a normal, uh, normal eyeball should feel like. Now, if it's soft, like the ones on your ear, you might be thinking along the line of a uveitis. The pressure goes down instead of going up. But if it feels like the tip of your elbow, it's that hard, then uh, usually that's what we call a, an, uh, a glaucoma in exacerbation or acute angle closure glaucoma. The pressure is now very high. That's why your patient's pressures are, your patient's eye is very painful, very red, and the blurring uh, of the vision is very pronounced. But remember, glaucoma is not defined by pressure it's actually a neuropathy it's actually a problem with the blood vessels so even if your eyes are not red even if your pressure is not that elevated you patients might still have glaucoma so you need to still look at the patient's optic nerve you're looking at the optic nerve if it's um if it looks like a glaucoma then you might be dealing with the glaucoma despite your patient not having red eyes or not having hard eyes but if your patient already has a hard very hard eye redness blurring of vision then you might be you may be dealing with an acute ankle closure attack or probably uh, a, a, a glaucoma um, especially if it's been happening for uh, several uh, several days weeks and sometimes patients will come in despite having the problems for months Previous eye surgery would also cause redness. This is uh, an infection in a patient's eye that un just underwent surgery. The, um, the patient had an infection. So it's this is called endophthalmitis. The conjunctiva is um, inflamed. The anterior chamber is inflamed. The front part of the eye is inflamed. You can see a hypopion, the white uh, fluid layer the inside of the uh, the inside of the anterior chamber you have several floating fibrins the eyeball itself is is very painful so th this is basically an infection uh, and endophthalmitis is an infection of the entire eye from front to back sometimes you can see patients uh, whose eyes are red because they under uh, it, either they had a surgery a, a complication of the surgery or their problem is they already have a problem a problematic eye that was trying uh, that the surgery was trying to solve in this case this is a corneal transplant patient or a penetrating keratoplasty patient you can see the sutures the central clear part is from a donor uh, cornea and the white part is the patient's uh, own eye. <clears throat> the redness around the eye, the eyeball is because of the degenerative problem of the patient's eye. And the center part is uh, from the donor cornea is enabling the patient to see again. Trauma would also cause a lot of problems as far as your patient is concerned. The redness would be... Uh, not just in the conjunctiva, but sometimes around the eye, um, periorbit. Uh, this uh, we can call this a periorbital hematoma, again because of blunt trauma. But sometimes it uh, the blood also is underneath the the conjunctiva so much that it's pushing the conjunctiva out already. You can release the bleeding here so that you won't have a lot of pressure inside the eye. It's very scary, but it's actually just blood being accumulated behind. The conjunctiva now hopefully you don't have anything more serious than this but investigating a patient's eye is uh, is mandatory if you see a patient like this you do not take your pre your patient's pressure you do not press the eye you do not 
touch the eye um, or put any pressure on the eye because if the patient has a laceration in the globe, in the sclera, or anywhere, you could actually be pressing the insides of the eye uh, and pushing them out. <clears throat> Sometimes you just see bleeding inside the eye. You can see the, uh, the fluid level inside the eye. It's not white it's red because this is a hyphema not a hypopion hyphema means there's blood in the anterior chamber you can see the level of the blood the patient actually had that blunt trauma and was bleeding from somewhere in the iris area you can see this area that area causing the bleed um, where the blood is actually uh, flowing from the uh, iris area into uh, the the blood pool in front again for sports enthusiasts um, this picture is just to show you that a shuttlecock from badminton and the ball from either a pickleball or a smash uh, from a pelota or sometimes even the uh, squash um, sports they f they're small enough to fit the orbit that means your the, the rim of your eyeball the, the rim of your uh, orbit will not protect you from this if you got hit from a basketball some of the force will be taken up by the uh, by the orbit or the rim of your um, uh, the rim of your uh, uh, orbit but these are small enough such that you will your eye can get the full impact of this uh, uh, of this injury so if you're playing badminton if you're playing pelota if you're playing squash and nowadays pickleball try to wear eye protection wear goggles but uh, there are a lot of uh, athletes who refuse to wear eye protection because they claim it um, hinders their peripheral vision now, a pterygium is also commonly uh, seen, especially in tropical countries. It's a reaction to exposure It's uh, to ultraviolet rays. Usually, it's the sun. It's an elastotic degeneration of your conjunctiva. It's crossing the limbus and into uh, the cornea. It will try to, uh, to cross towards the other side. The problem is if it starts to cover your pupil, it will now cause uh, problems in your vision so removing this is very easy it's just uh, on the outside there is a chance of recurrence but try to avoid having your eyes exposed to a lot of ultraviolet rays especially if you're working outside like um, um, field workers or uh, sailors or sometimes uh, farmers now this uh, pterygium is usually called different names depending on the country uh, sometimes it's called evil eye sometimes it's called surfer's eye sometimes it's called pogita or squid but the technical term would be pterygium now <clears throat> pterygium the way it's described is basic um, is basically uh, white in the uh, black part of the eye that's why it's actually mistaken sometimes for cataracts because cataracts would also look like white in the middle of the eye so you need to explain that this is on the outside and cataracts are in the inside of the eye now a pinguecula is a pterygium that did not cross the limbus so the the black arrow is pointing to the pinguecula it's practically the same as your uh, pterygium but it did not cross the limbus such that you don't need to touch it we do not operate on pinguecula's we don't do uh, surgeries there. It doesn't actually need uh, a lot of intervention. But if it starts to cross the, uh, the the limbus and starts to cross into the cornea, then it becomes a concern because it's now uh, it could now cause um, blurring of your patient's vision. So thank you very much for keeping um, for staying with us. And if you have any question, do not uh, hesitate to put it in the comments below and um, have a good day.